All right, a student sent me this equation online for me to be able to graph. So to be able to help them, I want to make a video to hopefully also help you. So let's get into it. All right, so I think it's very important to understand whenever we are graphing a trigonometric function like the cosine function, in this case, there's two things we need to know. One, we want to always want to know what exactly the initial period is of the parent graph of cosine. And then we also want to be able to identify all the important parts of a cosine when we have these transformations. So first of all, let's go ahead and go through what transformations are what we have here. So we have y equals a cosine of bx minus c plus d, that's gonna be all these little transformations. But if you're just gonna look at what the cosine graph looks like, y equals cosine of x, this initial period, is going to look something like this. Now, for the initial period, we're just gonna do the positive. I know it goes in the negative and it continues going over to the right. We can break this up into four different parts. It goes as high as one, goes down as low as negative one. We're gonna start up here, go to here, which is going to be at pi halves. Then it's gonna have a minimum at pi. It's gonna cross again at three pi halves and then go back up to its maximum at two pi. Now, I always go over this with my students on looking at like the unit circle to kind of always make sure that you can verify these values from the unit circle. And I think it's very helpful to remember what exactly the graph of cosine looks like, okay? So this is going to be our parent graph, that initial period. Now we have these transformations, right? We have this A, B, C, and D. And actually in this graph, we have all of them going on, which is gonna make this problem a little bit more difficult, but that's okay. So what we wanna do is identify, well, what are the important points that we need to know about this equation so therefore that we can graph it? The first one, which is only true for sine and cosine, is going to be to identify the amplitude. So the amplitude is going to be the half the distance from the max to the min. So you can see here, the half distance of the max to the min is going to be one. It goes as high as one, goes as down as negative one. So that distance from max to min is two, but half of that would be one. Now, the amplitude is represented in the equation as the absolute value of A. So you can see here, there's a one technically there, and that has an amplitude of one. Over here, my A is going to be five. So the absolute value of five, it's just going to be five. The next thing is going to be the period. How long does it take the graph to repeat itself? Because if we keep on graphing this function, every two pi, it's just gonna keep on repeating itself in the positive as well as in the negative direction. But what about when I have these transformations? How do I identify what the new period is going to be? Well, all you're simply gonna do is take two pi divided by b where b represents that coefficient of your variable inside of the function. So you can see here, I have a two, so my new period is going to be a two pi divided by two, which is just going to be a pi. The next thing that we want to be able to identify is going to be the transformations that we're working on. Oh, I'm sorry, actually before we get to that, now we have our period. The next thing is, if we're gonna graph this, we wanna know what our x scale is gonna be. And the x scale is basically gonna be where do all of these max, the intercepts, and the minimums are going to occur. Now you can see with cosine as well as with sine that those important points, parts, are going to occur in every fourth of an interval. So one, two, three, four. So I have four intervals here. So to identify what my new x scale is going to be, and you'll see once I get into the graphing why this is important, all we're simply gonna do is take our period and divide it by four. And then last but not least is we want to understand, actually I'm not done yet, but last but not least we want to, I don't know why I'm saying last but not least again, we're not done yet. <laughs> but the next thing we wanna do is identify the start of the period. So I'm only gonna do one initial period for this problem, but you can see that the initial period for cosine starts at zero. Well, if we have some transformations, some shifting, some left and right, we wanna know where is the new starting point. So all you're simply gonna do is you're gonna take what's inside your function because that's gonna be your horizontal transformations and you're gonna set that equal to zero because that is the initial period starting point. And therefore, just go ahead and solve for x and that will give you your new starting point. Okay. So interesting one, we got a negative three, but um, I guess we'll work with it. So we'll go in from on there. And then now we, I just wanna make sure I identify, so I have my start, right? I have my period. That's basically everything doing with my horizontal shifts. The last thing we just wanna know is there going to be any vertical transformations. And this is also the starting point. You could also think of this as like your phase shift, right? Because technically if you have a phase shift, that's gonna be negative three to the left. So this would be your phase shift of left three. And then we have a vertical shift, which is going to be up three. Okay, so a lot of times once I got, you know, later, later times, you know, helping students with graphing, I mainly just focused on them knowing these five parts. 
And I wasn't really concerned if they actually could graph it because in reality, graphing technology is so beneficial nowadays. We don't really need to, I think, be as specific or as detailed on our graphs because graphing technology is awesome. But in the spirit of helping this student to know how to graph this equation, let's go through the way that I used to do it with my students. Now again, every teacher is going to be a little bit different. You might have different directions on your test than what I'm doing, so hopefully that this will video will give you a little bit of help. But with the amplitude, with the transformations, I'm not gonna graph this on the same set of axes as I would with the initial period. That's why I just erase that, because it's gonna be pretty vastly different. So what I always like to do is just say, all right, here is going to be my new initial period. Now, the starting point is going to be at negative three, okay? So this is going to be negative three. You know, you could maybe say like, we'll find zero wherever zero is gonna be. I'll show you that. But then I'm gonna break it up into four different sections. One, two, three, four, okay? And let's see here. Each of those sections is going to be a negative three plus pi over four. And then the next one is going to be a two pi over four. So that'd be a negative three plus pi halves. And then this one would be a negative three plus three pi over four. And then this one would be a negative three plus a pi, or four pi over four, which would be pi. And you could see that that's gonna be a positive. So zero is probably somewhere in there. Now you could find the decimal equivalent, but to be honest with you, in all my years of teaching, I don't think I've actually ever done a problem like this. Whenever we had a starting point that was gonna be in numbers, my period was usually in numbers as well. So this is kind of a interesting problem that the student had to do. The next thing I wanna do is use my transformations to shift up the graph. Remember the initial graph, actually I should do a quick little sketch. Remember the initial graph started at one. Well now I'm shifting the graph three units up. So now that new initial point is not gonna be at one, but it's gonna be at four. Actually, sorry, before I get to that, it's not gonna be at four because we obviously we're gonna have this amplitude. Here's what I would do. Notice that this is kind of a line of symmetry, right? The graph is going to be symmetric about this x-axis. So if I have a vertical shift up three units, what I'm simply gonna do is create a line of symmetry three units up. One, two, three. Sorry, it's been a while since I taught the graphing part. So I always like to do this because then I know that's where, kind of like where the graph would cross the x-intercept, that's kind of like representative of where the graph is going to cross. Because I know there's going to be an intercept here and I know there's gonna be an, it's not really intercept, but intercept of the symmetry line. There's gonna be a symmetry line here because if this was shifted down, if there was no vertical transformations, those would be x-intercepts. Now what I need to do is understand what is my amplitude. Remember when the amplitude was one, basically from your x-intercept, you went up one and then down one, right? So here I need to go up five units from this line of symmetry. So one, two, three, four, five. That's gonna be my new x-intercept. And then also I need to go down five. One, two, three, four, five. So now this is going to be my low point and this is going to be my high point. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Very good, okay. So now that's gonna be my low point, which is gonna be represented right here. I'm just gonna go ahead and reframe this shot or this graph, and then this would be my high point over here. So now I can just go ahead and sketch the graph. So it's gonna go here, it's gonna cross there, it's gonna go down to here, and then it's gonna go up to here and up to there. So that's step-by-step step how you go and graph it. If you really wanna see the power of how this graph relates to your initial period or your initial parent graph, then what I would recommend is going into Desmos, typing them both in the same, and then kind of seeing that. But if you're just looking for a step-by-step -step process, how to graph a function like this, I hope this video was helpful.